Welcome everybody. My name is Adam Oster and I am the community engagement librarian for the Library of Michigan. I'm also joined by my uh, colleague Jennifer Sissota. Jennifer, why don't you go ahead and tell everybody what your role is at the Library of Michigan? Yeah, absolutely. So I am the digitization librarian and I primarily work with our LM digital website. Um, I do most of our in-house scanning and of course all the other duties that fall under the librarian hat, which are ever ever increasing and ever varied, but primarily anything involving digi digitization is where you can find me. So Jennifer is gonna be uh, along with myself and our colleagues, uh, Matt Pacer and Mindy Babarskis is gonna be a rotation of the four of us who will be doing um, uh, programs, digital programs for the Library of Michigan. Um, uh, Last year, what we had done is we were trying to do a combination of both virtual and in person. Uh, we discovered we were finding that we were doing a lot better with number wise with doing it um, virtual. So um, uh, we're, we were actually getting some folks that were coming from even out of state, uh, all the way from like Las Vegas, Tennessee, the Carolinas. Um, so uh, this is our first one of this year. Uh, we are going to be doing a couple ones that are that are repeats of last year, maybe with a slightly different flavor to them, but then also introducing some new topics as well. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more at the end as far as the where to find out more about uh, registering for those others, um, if you haven't had a chance to do so uh, for that. And since I think we we've probably got everybody who's going to be joining us this morning, uh, why don't we go ahead or I'm sorry, this evening? Uh, We'll go ahead and get st uh, started with the presentation itself. Just a few kind of uh, ground rules. If you can, please keep yourself muted unless you're gonna be asking a question. Um, otherwise you can either put it in the meeting chat or if you wanna wait until the end. Um, what we're gonna be doing is first uh, giving just a little bit of an overview of what the Library of Michigan is and what we do. Then getting into more about Ancestry itself uh, several of the different types of documents that you can find on there, and then also doing a demonstration at the end of it. Um, so as far as um, the library itself and what we do, uh, I always like to give a little bit of a, a breakdown of what it is that the library does. So we are an institution created by the state of Michigan to collect, preserve, and provide access to the story of the state and to support libraries in their role as essential community anchors. Uh, we have been around since 1828, um, uh, which is during Michigan's territorial days. Uh, and the Library of Michigan has served state government and the people of Michigan, much as how the Library of Congress works at the federal level. So if you're ever looking at sort of like a model institution of how the Library of Michigan works, look at the Library of Congress where they serve both the federal government and the people of the United States. Some key dates, uh, like I said, 1828, that's when we were started as the Michigan Territorial Library. Uh, at that time, there was 131 items in the collection. It's now expanded to well over a million. Uh, we became the state library in 1837 after Michigan statehood. Uh, we then moved to Lansing in 1847 um, uh, when the state capital moved from Detroit to Lansing previously during those territorial and early statehood days. Uh, Detroit was the home of, of Michigan's first capital. And that picture that's actually on the top of the right there, that's the first uh, capital building that was in uh, um, Detroit at that time. Um, we then, uh, when we moved to Lansing, we were in the second capital building. Uh, as they were constructing the third capital building, we were moved to uh, a different building, eventually went back when the third capital and current capital was built. We stayed in there for several decades, um, then moved to a couple other different locations. And then finally in 1988 was when uh, the Michigan Library and Historical Center opens, which is the current building that we're in right now. Um, you'll also notice that in the uh, early 80s and 1983, we transitioned from being the state, the Michigan State Library to the Library of Michigan. You know, since we're just down the road from, uh, Michigan State University and Michigan State University libraries. There was a bit of a, you know, it didn't help to have two institutions within a few miles of each other. 
um, having quite similar names. So being the li- being the library of Michigan, like how the Library of Congress is, helps with uh, distinguishing between the two institutions. And on the bottom of uh, the right there, you can see the picture of the current uh, building that we're in, the Michigan Library Historical Center. We are on the west or the left side. And then on the right side is the State Museum and the State Archive. So if you wanna find anything, Michigan history, literature, you name it, it's all within this central building. Um, uh, I will also say, There was a question that was sent to me in the chat uh, asking about a handout. There will not be uh, a handout. However, we will be recording today's uh, session and it will be available uh, fairly quickly on the Library of Michigan Facebook page. And then once we get it captioned, it will then be available on YouTube and we'll have a link to it on our website for people to reference back to. Uh, We've also been putting on our family history page a link to other different recordings of sessions that we've done in the past so you can find archived ones there as well uh this is an interior shot of what the library of michigan looks like uh one key difference is that we recently upgraded the tables that are in the middle of the atrium there um the lamps are still there Uh, those are a key feature of the library's architecture um but we wanted to upgrade the tables since they've been here since when we opened in the 80s and try and add some more uh, useful technology like having power uh, right within the tables, USB connections, different things like that. Um, And when it comes to the different collections, um, the primary collection that a lot of people um, use if they're uh, in state government or for some uh, family history researchers is the Michigan Documents Collection. We try to collect anything and everything that has been uh uh created by state governments um so that includes the early joint documents the annual reports of state government departments agencies and commissions other compiled rules and laws um we also have the michigan collection uh which is sort of the big one that most everybody who is doing family history research uses and that has everything from newspapers periodicals gazetteers and city directories Plats and other types of maps, uh, county or place histories, cemetery transcriptions, other unpublished material, um, but anything that has been published about the state of Michigan in any way, we try to get a copy of it. Uh, we are also home to the state law library, um, and uh, so anybody who is interested in trying to get a greater understanding of laws in Michigan and how they have transitioned over time, which can certainly be a useful tool for anybody who um, is trying to find out, you know, laws in a, you know, time period where an answer ancestor may have had either run in with, um, you know, some sort of law enforcement and committed a crime to, you know, having a greater understanding of what local ordinances at the time period or law enforcement, different things like that. Um, We also have a rare book room, which uh, is divided into uh, roughly three topics, um, Americana, law, and um, uh, um, other sort of uh, Michigan unique items. Um, That is by appointment only. And um, so you have to contact us ahead of time. and uh, I think one of my favorite items that's in there is there are the uh, um, county uh, mining inspector reports um, that uh, counties up in the UP where their mine inspectors had to uh, produce every year. And um, it gets into various things of like the different accidents that occurred with different miners to um, a wide range of different things. So it's always cool to check those out. Um, We're also always on the outlook for uh, a lot of different things. Um, If you're ever interested in donating items to the Library of Michigan, um, if you just go to michigan.gov slash library gift, um, that has more information on there uh, about those sorts of things. So um, when it comes to the different family history resources, um, a good place to go to uh, online with what we have is to go to our family history uh, section of our website, um, which is michigan.gov slash family history. 
Um, we have several databases that are available also on the website. Um, and there's links to those there and plus on our online resources for library card holders. Um, and to get a library card uh, through the Library of Michigan, you can go uh, either online to michigan.gov slash library card um, and apply online, um, or you can come to the library itself and uh, get a physical card here. Um, if you apply online, it'll give you just access to our online databases. Um, but if you wanna be able to check out items that do circulate at the Library of Michigan, um, you'll wanna come to our, our facility in Lansing and get a uh, physical card from us um, at the reference desk. So, and while we do have a lot of things online and I, when I'm in the demonstration point of our, our website, I'll show where many of those things are. It's only a fraction of what we have available um, in print in, in our physical collections. While uh, somebody like Jennifer is doing a lot to get things digitized, they're just, uh, it, it will be a while before most of the collection is anywhere close to being, uh, of what we can scan being put on online and available for people to use. All right, um, so that is in a nutshell what the Library of Michigan is all about, what we do. Um, there's certainly more beyond that, but let's get into sort of the meat of what we're talking about um, and start talking about what uh, Ancestry Library Edition is. Um, I see there is a question in the chat. Do you add the videos on YouTube to the Library of Michigan playlist on the Michigan Department of Education page? Uh, yes, we do. We will, because we're under the Michigan Department of Education, um, the videos themselves will go there, but there is a specific Library of Michigan playlist on there. And I believe we also have a playlist on there that's for family history. So this one would go on there as well. Um, if you do have a hard time navigating YouTube to where to find them, I'll make sure when we're in the demonstration point to show where um, you can just go directly on our website for the links to those videos. Um, back to Ancestry. Ancestry is distributed, uh, Library Edition is distributed by ProQuest and um, powered by Ancestry.com. It has billions of records in census data, vital records, directories, photos, and more from countries all over the world. Um, at the time when I put this database together, or this, uh, I'm sorry, this presentation together, it had over 4,000 database and 2 billion names. I'm sure it has vastly increased uh, beyond that point. Um, and it is accessible on, sat, on site at subscribing libraries. I know during the uh, first year, year and a half of when COVID hit, um, ProQuest had made it so that Ancestry was available remotely to libraries that subscribe to it. But at the end of December of 2021, they unfortunately uh, discontinued that policy of theirs. So now you have to go physically to a library um, in order to access it. Uh, luckily, the Library of Michigan is one of those locations. There's certainly plenty of others um, in several parts of the state. Um, your best bet, if you aren't able to go to the Library of Michigan, um, check with your local public library. Um, and if they don't have it, look to see if one of the more larger libraries throughout your region has it, because um, in most cases, you can physically go to a library and even if you don't have a card with them, at least get on their, their computers and then um, use their online resources. That, that there is a, a walk-in policy that, that people have that anybody who comes in off the street um, can, can utilize their online resources. Okay, so when it comes to popular records, um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about some examples of them. Um, and a little bit of a rundown, just because, like, like I said, this is meant to be a very introductory uh, overview of Ancestry. So there may be some people that aren't familiar with some of the documents that are on there. Um, the federal census and state census, but primarily the federal census is um, on, the, uh, on the Ancestry platform, um, which has been conducted every 10 years since 1790. Um, 1790 through uh, oh, I forgot to change that 1940 to 1950. Um, 1790 through 1950 census manuscripts are available to the public, um, except the 1890 census mostly destroyed due to a fire in 1921. 
Um, census, and this is important to note, census records and data specific to individual respondents are not available to the public until 72 years after a given census is taken. So that means that between now and 72 years in the past, they won't release the um, population, you know, the, 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 where they went from house to house, um, gathering information of the names of people that that isn't released for 72 years after it's conducted. So that's why the 1950 census is the most um, recent one that has been uh, allowed out by the Census Bureau, which I believe is under the Department of Commerce. Now, there are other different types of census records that exist out there. Um, agriculture, uh, the mortality industry, agriculture is if like you had a family member that owned a farm um, and it would get into more descriptions of what uh, was available at, at their property, the different animals that they had. Uh, mortality, they didn't really do that too often, but like in 1880, they wanted to have a, um, uh, a census of what people died throughout the year of 1880 and what their uh, cause of death was. Um, industry is going to get into more like what businesses existed out there. If you had an ancestor that owned the local AMP. Um, it also is important to know that state censuses were typically conducted between the years of the federal census. Um, with Michigan, uh, ones that you can find out there, um, or uh, but they're not always complete, 1837, uh, 1845, 54, 64, 74, 84, 94. Um, an unfortunate thing is that most of these census records are not digitized and available on Ancestry Library Edition. There are some other ones that you can find, places that you can find them out there. I know the Archives of Michigan has some on their Michiganology platform. Um, I'm not sure if anything is on Family Search. I know other uh, state census records are out there in different places, some on um, Ancestry, some on other different platforms. So it's always good to, when, when you're looking for those, you're going to have to look at the, um, the breakdown of what are on some of these different platforms in order to find them. Uh, I see there's another question. Does the library maintain military records on Michigan residents uh, separate from Ancestry? Uh, we don't specifically have like the muster rolls or anything like that. Um, some of those things are over at the archives of Michigan. Um, what we do have are other sorts of publications that are for um, Michigan uh, per, uh, it, residents who had served in the military. So we'll have like the World War I honor books, um, uh, other different regimental histories, the Brown books that were uh, produced about individual Civil War resident uh, regiments. Um, so you can certainly do quite a bit of um, military research in the Library of Michigan collections. Um, and that also is a good uh, teaser that in a few months down the line, um, my colleague Matt Pacer will be giving a virtual presentation on how to do military record research at the Library of Michigan. So I would suggest everybody keep an eye out for that. I think it's going to be in May or Jennifer, if you get a chance, can we look and see when the military um, record presentation is going to be and put it in the chat? So uh, just continuing the uh, federal and state censuses, um, we're going to use uh, uh, Mary Frankhauser, who was state librarian from 1923 to 1933, as our example. So this is a picture of her. Uh, she was born in 1879 and died in 1958. And this is uh, an example of the 1930 U.S. Census for Lansing, Ingham County, Michigan. And if we zoom in. That is her right there. So it lists the household members that were living um, in the uh, building that she was at. So it looks like she was on, uh, I want to say it's 501 Townsend. Um, I think it might have been a boarding house because by this point in her life, her husband had passed away. Um, and I don't think she had any children living with her at that time. Um, but you can see where it has um, 
their personal uh, description, sex, race, age, and marital status and education, um, individual's birth location, the parent's birth location. So for her, um, it looks like all of her family, let's see, she was born in Michigan and her parents were born in Ireland. Um, also has occupation listed on there, so librarian and state library. I think a favorite of mine of the 1930 census is that at that time they were looking to see if um, people owned radios. So that's what that little R is that's um, over on, uh, let's see if you can follow my mouse, this area right here. So when it comes to things like vital records, um, uh, moving past the uh, the census, um, different types of forms of what will be out there are certainly birth, death, marriage, and divorce. Uh, record contents, which can vary, but isn't um, always complete or the same between them all. Certainly things like full name, birth or death year. Uh, obviously, the birth records and marriage records are going to have any death information on it, um, death, birth and death location, spouse or parents' names, uh, gender, burial location, and occupation. Um, when it comes to where these records vary, uh, come from, it varies between state to state. Oh, Jennifer just put in, it's going to be... Uh, what I'll days... retype that and fix that. My keyboard locked up. <laughs> ah, okay. So we know it's going to be at 6.30. <laughs> Um, but with Michigan, um, the two places, if you're trying to find it in print, like the actual uh, original copies, if they haven't been microfilmed or anything like that, is always checking with the county clerks or the um, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services with their uh, vital records office. Um, you can also find information through the county index books and uh, one thing to also look on as far as what we have here physically at the Library of Michigan is we have a Michigan Vital Records Research page that's on our website. You can look for that on the family history, history section of the, the web page. It'll have a, a bit more details as far as what's on microfilm here, what indexes that we have. Um, we also try to have some information as far as what's on different um, digital platforms, whether it's through Ancestry, Family Search, um, different things, uh, Michiganology, different things like that. Okay, so May 4 um, is when the mission and uh, the military resources at the Library of Michigan session is going to be. So anybody who's in interested in that should put that on their calendars. Um, you can certainly register for it right now. Um, all the registration for all of our 2023 programs is open for um, people to get signed up for. Uh, so another example of uh, one of our uh, state librarians, Mary Spencer, uh, she was the state librarian who preceded uh, Mary Frank Hauser. Uh, she was born in 1842 and died in 1923. And this is her death record. Um, and so shows up here on the top, uh, her full name that she died uh, while living at 326 Sycamore um, and uh, was a widow, her husband, um, Clinton Spencer, his name is written right there, so 81 years old, um, and then has her death information. It looks like senility and chronic myocarditis, I think. Um, Something that can always be useful is these little numbers that are right here that you often find on um, many death records, especially from uh, around the uh, 1890s on up uh, for several decades, as they have what's called the International Classification of Diseases Code on there. So there, if you do a Google search for that, you can usually find where the different editions of of those publications are out there. And if you're having a hard time reading the uh, cause of somebody's death, you can always use that as a other tool for trying to interpret that information. Um, we also have further down on here, the birthplace of where Mary Spencer came from, which is Pontiac, Michigan. Uh, her parents' names, it looks like her father came from Virginia and mother came from Vermont. Um, and then she ended up being buried in Ypsilanti, and we have a picture of her 
cemetery stone right here uh, in Highland Cemetery in Ypsilanti. So when I was uh, mentioning about vital records with the county indexes, this is um, what those uh, look like. They're the big books um, that often county clerks will have as far as recording um, vital records information. Um, this started in the 1860s in Michigan. I believe it was 1867 was when Michigan first uh, started requiring um, that uh, counties had to record this information. And we're going to dive back to Mary Frankhauser um, and her husband, William H. Frankhauser. And this is both their, their gravestones in, uh, they're both buried in Hillsdale. And they got married in 1900. And if we zoom in to the bottom here, it then has their information. So William Frankhauser was 36 years old. Mary E. Powers, some Powers was her maiden name. Um, was 21, and he came from Ohio. He was a lawyer, um, and she was born in Hillsdale and has their parents listed on there, um, both fathers and mothers, and date and location of the marriage, and then also the witness and individual who performed the marriage itself. Um, so only two lines, but certainly quite a bit of information that can give you a starting point um, as trying to track down uh, information about any ancestors that you're researching. So I know these um, are available uh, on, many of them are available on both Ancestry and Family Search. Uh, and also we have the microfilm versions of them here at the Library of Michigan. Newspapers and obituaries. Um, a lot of times people are looking for uh, newspapers and obit info and Ancestry itself does not have really many full text or scanned newspapers. What they've kind of done in order to get into the sort of the uh, digitization of newspapers is that Ancestry owns newspapers.com. And so what you'll find on Ancestry is that there is often an index of collections that then will refer you to newspapers.com. Um, and when you're using the library edition of Ancestry, it still has those collections in there. The one problem is, is that the, the URL that it gives you to go to the newspapers.com location of where that, that newspaper is at is for the paying edition of it. Now, the Library of Michigan does have a library edition of newspapers.com that people can access and they can access it remotely. It's just that there one the amount of newspapers between the personal edition versus the library edition is not the same. Unfortunately, it's very like looking at the uh, the Lansing State Journal. There's several decades, if not over a hundred years worth of it in the personal edition of newspapers.com. But when you look at the library edition, it's a certainly a fraction. But still, at the same time. You know, these indexes, um, so like the key collections, there's the newspapers.com obit index, which goes to the 1800s up to current, as well as the U.S. obituary collection uh, that goes from 1930 to the present. What you can do is you can use those news, those citations to either use our newspaper microfilm collection that we have here at the library, or you can get onto our databases. So some of the examples I listed on here uh, newspapers.com library edition, newspaper archive, other individual papers that we have like the Michigan Chronicle, Grand Rapids Press, uh, Detroit Free Press, Detroit News, Saginaw News. I know I'm missing at least a couple, but um, many of those newspapers which are listed on our online resources database will um, at least give you a starting point if you aren't able to um, come hit up the microfilm. City directories, so a city directory will contain an alphabetical list of citizens within a municipality. Uh, typically will list the names of the heads of households, their addresses and occupational information. Um, sometimes a wife's name will be listed in parentheses or italics following the husband. Um, may also contain a business directory, street directory, government directory, listing of town officers, schools, societies, churches, post offices, and other miscellaneous matters of general local interest. Um, those things 
are certainly just as relevant as the names of the people that are in the directories because having a business directory, if your ancestor owned a gas station or owned a local AMP or a funeral parlor or something like that, you would be able to use the direct, the business directory to find where that business was located um, or churches or other different schools that um, uh, where they existed at one point and if they ended up being demolished and moved to another location. So using another one of our um, state librarians, we're gonna use Lolita Fayan. So she was state librarian from, I say the eight, uh, 1941 to 1961. I think she started right, right before World War II was starting um, and the US's involvement of it. And so we've got the 1953 city directory and it has both her and her husband Clarence listed in it. Um, they were living at uh, 222 Center Lawn in East Lansing. Um, and it lists that he was doing real estate and she was a uh, librarian for the state library. And they're both listed right there. You can also find other different uh, tools, uh, certainly like the draft registration cards for World War I and World War II. Um, those are certainly sort of uh, focused down to only a limited time period and certainly to males of a certain age, but can certainly be just as much helpful tools when you're trying to follow a family during a particular time period. Um, we'll have everything from order and serial numbers that are assigned by the Selective Service, full name, date of, and place of birth, race, citizenship, occupation, personal description, and even seeing their signature. I haven't. Se I have seen a few examples of where somebody who couldn't write just made their mark with an X, um, but usually you would find somebody's actual signature on there. So this is for World War I. Uh, we'll be using uh, Lolita Fian's husband, Clarence, because um, he's one of the few examples that I have where I have both a World War I and World War II card for a uh, spouse of one of the state librarians. Um, so this is when he was living in, uh, I believe he was in Detroit. Yep. Uh, born July 1888, originally from Port Huron. Uh, worked for the engineering department of the Michigan State Telephone Company. Uh, at the time, it looks like he was single and then had a tall, slender, uh, uh, gray eyes, light colored hair. Um, and this was filled out in 1917 and he was in his 20s at the time. Um, so it has everything from name and birth information, physical description and occupation. Looking at the uh, World War II draft card, it has a bit more details on there. Um, it also gives a confirmation that he uh, and Lolita were living at 222 Center Lawn. So it's always good when you get multiple records that all uh, correlate the same information. Um, and uh, other different things on here, like name and address of a person who will know him. Um, so it has a, a Leela E. Fian who was living in Detroit. I'm assuming that's either a sister or some other relative. Um, and that he was uh, five foot 10, 165 pounds, had a scar on his kneecap. Um, There's so a little bit more extra physical description on here. Um, I see there was a question, will Vietnam War info be available soon? That I don't know. Hopefully at some point that does get made available. The problem is, is that there was the fire at one of the record places or that was uh, operated by the um, uh, National Archives back, I think in the 60s or the, or the 70s. I think it was, no, it was a little bit later than that. And I know that had a significant impact on a wide range of World War I, World War II, um, Korea, and some and Vietnam records. So when it comes to draft registration, I don't know at what point that's going to ever become available, but it would be interesting um, if that that does get available to the public. So um, and what that what forms that exist in. So 
hopefully we'll we'll see something related to that in the, in the near future. When it comes to different searching tips, um, just a few uh, things to kind of point out to folks. Um, always remember that the names of individuals and how their names are spelled can change over the course of their lives. Be cognizant of factors in play at the time the information uh, was recorded. Uh, so language barriers, knowing, I mean, I've got so many Polish ancestors on my dad's side that came over in the 1870s and 1880s that even at, even with having been in Michigan for you know several decades, there, if they did learn English, it was certainly was spoken with a significant, uh, um, uh, you know, Polish accent, and may have made it uh, harder to um, fully convey what their last name and first and last names were, let alone what the spellings of them were, um, and also that the record recorder uh, not not talking with the actual person. So it could be a landlord, it could be a spouse, offspring following a person's death. Um, it, there could be several factors in play that it may make a difference as far as like the spelling of the person's name or other information. Um, if you look at uh, places like the, you know, county poor farms or county infirmaries or the state asylums, you know, you're dealing with other you know, factors like um, elderly age or uh, mental uh, disabilities that may impact how they convey that information. So it's always important to know that um, when you're uh, researching somebody's name. Um, and ways in which you can kind of work with the databases like Ancestry is to use um, wildcards when you're searching for the names so that it does spelling variations. Um, a question mark replaces a single name a single letter and a name, um, and then an asterisk symbol uh, will complete a word with multiple variations at the end of it. So, um, so if you're looking at something like Frank Hauser and you don't know how the Hauser part at the end of it is, you can put Frank and then an asterisk symbol, and then that will give you different variations of the spelling of the word. And also try to, when it comes to place names, be consistent with how you type those locations in the place field on a database. Always go with the city or township name, comma, county, comma, state, comma, country. So with Lansing, it's Lansing, comma, Ingham, comma, Michigan, comma, United States. Uh, and one thing about Ancestry that's really cool is that it has an autofill feature. Um, but sometimes it's not always perfect. So a good example from where I, I used to work was um, I used to work in Kentwood, Michigan. And before Kentwood was a city after the 1960s, it was Paris Township. But Ancestry doesn't have Paris Township as part of its autofill feature. And you may find other localities that had been townships before they became cities or an extent into cities. Um, so then you may just have to type it in as opposed to using the autofill feature. Other searching tips, um, browse the card catalog. Don't necessarily rely on using the search box. So what you can use, do is hit use browse collection catalog or the other collection types to narrow your search to specific collections or record types. Um, collection focus can be further refined by the locations and the time period. And another, tip within the searching tips is periodically check when a collection has been updated. Collections are frequently updated with new content. And you could do that by going up to the top here and instead of sort by name, you can change that to sort by date added uh, or by record count. And it will um, show you when something has either been updated or is a new collection. Um, and so a couple of different ways to kind of see as things are, are changed over over time as new materials added to Ancestry. So when it comes to the other uh, refining results feature that's on the uh, left side of the database itself, you can use um, the filter to feature to refine your search results to either specific record types or collections, uh, whether it's a collection, a location, a time period, or language. 
There are many things that are still in the original language. I know uh, like some of the Hamburg line um, transfer, you know, when people are going from Hamburg, Germany to the United States, that those uh, ship lines, the records are still in the original German. Um, maybe the names have been uh, transcribed in a few other things, but if you're trying to read the whole record, uh, start working on your 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 uh, German or uh, see if you can find somebody else to help you out with the translation of it. And last, uh, I believe this is the last one, is that when it comes to citation information, always look on the bottom of the record when you first bring it up before you look on the actual um, image itself. So there is the source citation, source information of like where the database came from. There's also the original data. So this is where it's using the draft registration cards. And so you can see that originally those cards came from uh, United States Selective Service System, World War I Selective Service System draft registration cards, 1917 to 1918 collection that is through the National Archives and Records Administration. And that um, it was imaged from the Family History Library microfilm collection. So knowing that information, especially when it comes to things like if you're trying to prove lineage, um, you always want to have that information available um, as you're going along. And if you ever need help with uh, making clear citations for the records that you find, um, whether they're on Ancestry or not, there is a Cite Your Sources citation help on the Family Search uh, wiki. Um, that you can just go to familysearch.org and under the records tab is where the wiki is and you can just put citate or cite your sources in and that will bring that up and it'll give a bit more details um, on how to do that. So it's just like with going to school, um, you always have to cite your sources no matter what you're what you're uh, co compiling. Um, oh, build a document chronology. That's another good tool. Um, as you're going along with your research, take all the documents and records that you have for a specific person and make a list of them all in chronological order. Um, this is where you take like the uh, narrow it down by year, state, county, city, address, occupation, document source. Um, so I have an example here using Lolita Fian. Um, so that we have uh, the different years in which a record was created, where she was living at that time or where the record was created, uh, address, source of where they, that all came from. And this is kind of cool because if you do keep a printed file um, or if you have a digital collection of these records, it acts as almost a table of contents. Um, and then as you add things on, you just you can use um, Microsoft Word or Excel to create these. And then as you find more records, you can uh, add uh, a new ver create a new version of it or just have it saved and then add new lines onto them. OK, so before I bring up the website itself, is there any questions that we have so far? Um, you can either put them in the chat or if you want to um, unmute yourself, I can go back to one of the slides. Okay, nothing so far. So um, what I'm going to do is end the slideshow, and I'm going to bring up uh, our website. So this is the, I'm going to go to the Library of Michigan homepage here a second, just so you can see it from the start. So this is the um, Library of Michigan homepage. Um, so it's michigan.gov slash library of Michigan. And uh, a few things just on the front of it, um, certainly access to our catalog, which is answercat.org. Um, other things like our where to get to our programs for the public, listing right here, and then information for the public, for libraries and for state employees. Um, most people who are doing family history research are gonna wanna go under for the public. Um, I'm first just gonna show where family history is. Um, so click on that. 
And then what this has is information as far as the different county guides that we have. Um, if you are somebody who is out of the area um, and uh, need help with somebody or need with somebody who can do research here at the library, because library staff themselves are quite limited with time. There's only 10 of us in special collections and uh, we can help, but we, we can't devote hours of help. Um, but if you do need to get a professional researcher to work with, there is uh, the Michigan Genealogy Research Network. We don't endorse anybody, but we do have um, names of folks that you can get in contact with if you're looking for either assistance within like the Ingham County area or elsewhere within Michigan. Um, things like more information on our newspapers, um, links to the online resources for cardholders, which is where you can get access to our different databases, where to find our programs for the public listing, um, the video tutorials, and then the vital research um, at the Library of Michigan. Uh, quick click on that a second. And this just shows when it comes to uh, what we have for births, um, indexes of that, marriages, and what's on microfilm and what years that we have, uh, divorces. Keep in mind with divorces is that it's either just an index or it's a summary. Uh, it's also important to note that the summary is not the actual record itself or the court record. And so that would be something you'd either have to go to the, the original court where the divorce took place or to see if those are at the archives of Michigan. Uh, other things as far as death records and then links to uh, Michiganology and family search. And if you do need to get in contact with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, there is their info right here. Um, or if you're looking for a county clerk in the county, there's a directory that you can click on right there. Um, video tutorials. These are the ones that we did uh, in 2022 and some of the ones from 2021. Um, as we are going through this year, this is one spot that will have the links for anything that uh, we've done um, throughout this year. Uh, also different links right here. Uh, go to uh, Family Search, Library Congress, other different things. Um, to go to online resources for library card holders, you can either click it right here or it's under for the public. Um, before I go to that, in order to access any of those things on there, you need to get a Library of Michigan library card. And this is the online uh, form to do it. So you just put your first name, last name, email address, a little bit of other info on there. Typically takes about anywhere from two business days to a week, depending on how many that we uh, get at any particular time. I'll say that if a lot of people this evening register, just remember it might be closer to that week and not the two business days. Um, and then getting to online resources. So this is where all of our different databases are available and Ancestry Library Edition. Go ahead and click on that. So now, as you can see up on the top here, it shows that we're logged in as the Library of Michigan. Um, and uh, you can go down here a little bit further and it has different areas of where you can just search the census or vital records, military information, um, other quick links that go to um, public tree, public member trees. So anybody who has a personal account to Ancestry can create a family tree and it is available where you can search them using the library edition, but you can't like, take records and put it onto um, your own tree. Um, you have to sort of download things and then upload them uh, on there. Um, there just isn't a direct path of doing it. Uh, getting into the other different sort of topics, the city directories, schools and other, so like they have yearbooks on there, the newspaper obits, maps, other different things like that. You can also go up here to search and that's where the card catalog is right here. So if I click on that, it's then going to show right now it's showing the date added. And I can either do record count, date updated, collection title. Um, before I do that, I'm first going to go over here and just narrow it down by locality. 
as you can see, filter by location or dates. I'm going to hit US. And I want to see what's available just for Michigan. So it looks like there is 804 individual collections that have Michigan materials in them. Um, I can also see the updated. So some things like the 18 or yeah, 1850 census, newspaper o, um, newspapers.com obituary index. And it looks like we have other things like Michigan U.S. federal nationalization records other different things on here. And you can even narrow it down by county if you want or by other filters over here. So I'm gonna go back to the homepage and hit begin searching. And let's do a search for Lolita Flynn. And she was living at Michigan in the state of Michigan. So here's where it does the auto um, input in on here so there's either like michigan city in indiana michigan a city within clinton county indiana but we want michigan usa you can also hit show more options and that's where you can add in a person's birth marriage or death information you can also list in their parents any siblings spouse children because like if you get a name like john smith and they're living in Michigan. There's a million of those. But if you've got a John Smith whose wife is named Harriet, that's something that can help narrow it down. But Lolita, we know, is a pretty unique name. So I'm just going to go ahead and hit search. So one of the things that initially comes up here is the newspapers.com obit index. So I'm going to open that up um, just to give you an idea of what that looks like. So right here, we have the detailed information as far as like uh, full name, Lolita Dawson Fyan, female, 94 years old, born in 1894 in Clinton, Iowa, death date about 1990, uh, death place, Lansing, obituary date, March 17, 1990, and then the newspaper is the Lansing State Journal. We go to the source, this URL right here is what will take us to the newspapers.com personal uh, edition of it. So if you already have that and you're already logged into it on another tab, you could just copy that and then where it says go to that URL, you could then hit that and then it would open it right up. But if you don't have a newspapers.com um, account, you would then either have to go to the library edition of it or come to the Library of Michigan and try and uh, track down the microfilm, which we should have because this was from 1990. But that's the way in which you would um, utilize one of the newspaper indexes that's on here. It's also kind of cool where suggested records will come up on the side uh, based on the different types of information that you use. So uh, one of them, like here is the US birth. So, this is for Lolita Irene Dawson, which fits the other information that we have on her. Uh, we can click on it. And so then we have affidavit of birth uh, for use in cases when certificate of birth cannot be applied. So it has her parents' names on there. Um, looks like her dad was a newspaper reporter. Uh, Mother Phoebe was listed as a home manager. That's an interesting, I'm assuming that's homemaker or something of that sort. And it has other information on here as well. So we can also go back to the other list here. So U.S. Death Index. So this is just an index, um, but at least gives us an idea of the death date and birth date, um, where she was living over in uh, Meridian Township, um, which is... And she, uh, from just from her history, I know she was living at Bircham Hills at that point, uh, one of the retirement homes in the area. So we also have the 1850 census right here. We can actually take a look at that because the 1850 cent, or I'm sorry, 1950 census um, in Lansing and in Ingham County, they had a unique 
form that they used. And I think, yeah, this is one of them. That there was just two places in Michigan that had a couple different versions of that. So it has her right here and her hus husband, Clarence. She was 55. He was 61. Real estate librarian, executive state library. And say if you find a record on here that has multiple pages, you can either use the little arrows that are over here on the side, or you can go down here and open up the previews of the other different images and click on them to go to the next one. Um, you can zoom in, you can zoom out. Um, when you go up to save on here, um, you can hit save to this computer, which is then saving it either onto the computer that you're using, or if you have a flash drive, you can put it on there and do it that way. So a lot of different tools. Uh, I believe you can also, yeah, invert the colors. So if you have a hard time seeing it with the white background and with black text, you can flip it so it's black background with white text. You can also rotate it left and right, uh, other different settings like that. So we're going to close out of here. And so the different things like the city directories are right here. Um, you can also narrow the uh, way the name is recognized using these toggles over here or the location. So if you would put a city, so if like we had put Lansing, Michigan here, in fact, let's do that right now. Lansing, AM. A search. And you wanted to make sure that anything that you had was either within the state or county or adjacent to counties. You can then toggle over and then hit apply. And that changes that number from, was it 52,000 just down to 157. So that's a really cool tool if you're trying to really narrow the scope down to a particular place. So. There's other different things that are on uh, here. There is a learning center that you can use if you're trying to find more information just on basic types of records that are on Ancestry. Um, there's also different charts and forms that you can use that are useful, like the ancestral chart, um, research calendar, family group sheets, different things like that. And let's go back to the home page. That's kind of the big things that are on there. Um, let's go see. The database. Okay. So, does anybody have any questions? Um, do you want me to do a sample search or anything else that you're looking for? Um, feel free to unmute yourself right now if you want to type it into the chat. I can also go back to our website if you want to see something else on there. As we're just hitting about the 7.30 mark, and I know we'll we'll wrap it up here in just a few minutes, but I just want to make sure we had time for questions and other, uh, other different uh, things, if you have anything that you want to know about. Adam, I have two things. Okay. Uh, one, could you go back to, I guess it was the Excel spreadsheet that you had on the lady with the the year and the city and the state stuff. I was trying to write it down and I can barely see it and I couldn't write it all. Okay. So you're talking the... Um, That's it. Yeah. Bring it up here a second. Oh, that's better. I can almost read it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, what and what it has on the top here, and I made this just in Excel, it has the year, state, county, city and township. <laughs> address location and then the source and some of it i just kept it fairly simple because it was just it was just an example but you can also get more in depth um and let's see do you have a search history um i don't believe there is a search history on Ancestry itself. 
However, your browser may have um, may maintain the search history of what you you use on there. I'm just not sure. Just seeing that in the chat here. Um, and I see there's the question, would you please repeat the name of the codes used on the death certificates? That's the International Cl uh, Classification of Diseases, or somebody else put in here the International List of Causes of Death. Um, Marge, did you get everything that you needed to on here? I did get that, yes. Okay. Um, I did have one suggestion, um, yeah. but before I mention that to you, the medical list number thing, yeah, I've seen it, uh, people list. It's called Wolf something or other. I can't remember what I it was. I think it's Wolf Bane. Um, yes. Yeah. So I'm just going to do international. Yeah. And there's different years for that. So you have to watch the year of death and the year of publication. Yep. So and that's the one other uh, suggestion that I had for your website mm -hmm. is on the family history part where you have all the different databases listed yeah. um they're in alphabetical order now they weren't previously yeah i was wondering which is good but i was wondering if you could make a listing like say newspapers and then take all the newspapers and make them sublisted under that so the newspapers are all together because not everybody who researches michigan necessarily knows what newspapers there are. So there's like Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti, Bay City, Saginaw, yeah. Grand Rapids, and all of those. And if you list them as newspaper, as the heading, and then sub alphabetically, the mm -hmm. ones that you have digitized and uploaded. Uh, I can see, see if we can do something with that. Or what we might do is, oh, I don't know. Because we could make newspapers just their own completely separate area. And well, that's a possibility it. too, but yeah. You know. Yeah, I know we're getting we're getting a lot more on there than what we uh, you know, when we first started doing uh doing a lot of this, that we we only had just a few, but we've certainly tried as much as we can to get at more added on. So but no, though that's some good suggestions and uh See if we can make it a little bit more. We're always about user experience and making it a little bit better. Um, let's see. There's one other question. Resources for somebody who settled in Cass County just before statehood. Um, what I would recommend for that is first looking on the, let's go back to family history, and then going to county guides. And Cass is right here. So these are all the different, uh, well, not everything, but the different selected works that we have that are related to Cass County that we have in print. Um, some of them like a brief history, um, transcriptions of early marriages, newspapers, maps, a few other different uh, collections that we have as far as like records, indexes and transcriptions, other government publications. That's a pretty good starting point. Um, as far as anything else besides that, um, I guess it would just uh, depend on, on what about the person that you're trying to find. Um, yeah, I don't remember. Uh, it looks like I think that it looks like 1829 was when Sorry, that new yeah, newly formed county was named after Lewis Cass. So um how to find a picture of my great grandfather who was a church musician in Detroit for over 46 years. Well, I mean, you can certainly look in the newspaper for if he was ever listed in there. I know we do have some church histories, so you can always look in our catalog to see if we have any um uh, books that books with church histories that may have had had have him in there. Um, so that's a good starting point for something like that. Uh, I'm trying to think of anything else. Um, and as far as other things for Cass County, I think 
a lot of that you'll you'll you can either come and look for these books or another spot that you can always look for information um related to cass county is there are the um do i have it listed on here the mini michigan county histories and atlases that's a website that the university of michigan put together and you can then browse through to see what titles that they have digitized that are uh related to cass county and then see if anything is listed in there so it looks like cass county history there's a few books that are on there 20th century history of Cass County. You can also go on the Hatt Hattie Trust website to see if there's any other digitized titles that are on there. And that is Digital Library. Here, and I'll put the URL for that. And this is a, a collection of digitized materials that's been put together by um, the University of Michigan, several other Big Ten schools, um, other universities throughout the United States. Um, some things you can download the whole uh, item from. Others, you can see individual pages. So I think we're going to wrap up here soon. Just a few other last things is that if you do uh, want to get in contact with us at the Library of Michigan or come visit us, our uh, Address is 702 West Kalamazoo Street in Lansing. Phone number is 517-335-1477. And we answer the phones uh, during our open hours, which is uh, 10 to 5, Monday through Friday, and 10 to 4 on Saturdays. Um, we do have some weekends that we are closed, so it's always good to look on our website for when those dates are going on. Uh, we're actively on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Main website, michigan.gov slash library of Michigan. Uh, library card, michigan.gov slash library card. Uh, family history, michigan.gov slash family history. Um, I also want to point out the next virtual program is going to be related to African American digital resources, which will be on, oops, that should say February 2, 2023. Um, and to register michigan.gov slash LM public programs. And then lastly, if you are affiliated with a um, library or historical or genealogical society, or if you just want to have one to uh, make notes on, um, we do have a brochure that's on the bottom of the LM public program site that has the um, things uh, as far as like the dates of everything, the registration information. Um, in fact, I'm gonna go to that right now just to show everybody where that's at. So if we go back to the programs for the public and down here on the bottom is the downloadable printable 2023 program PDF and that's it right there. And you can save it, print it off. Um, and like I said, if you're affiliated with a library or society, um, feel free to share that with any of your members. And does anybody have any last questions before we wrap things up? Um, if you do ever think of anything, feel free to uh, shoot us an email or give us a call. And like I said, our next program is going to be coming up on February 2. I want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. Um, sorry for the slight minute or two delay start. Um, and uh, hope to see you either here at the Library of Michigan uh, or online at one of our next programs.